Hey everybody, it's David. So we just had some news last week that the next big exoplanet mission from NASA will now have its launch date pushed back a little bit by about three months into December 2017. Now don't panic, I really don't think this is bad news at all. TESS always had a fairly ambitious launch schedule, so for them to be speaking about a three month delay, a year and a half out from launch, probably means that everything's on track there, so we really shouldn't worry. So given that the next big exoplanet mission is on the horizon, I thought it'd be fun to look back at the legacy of the last big exoplanet mission launched by NASA, and that's Kepler. I've actually spent most of my professional career analyzing and modeling the Kepler data, so I can certainly attest for how revolutionary its discoveries have been, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But first, I want to point out that this revolution that we've had from the Kepler telescope is really the second scientific revolution of that namesake, the first being Johannes Kepler. Johannes Kepler was a German astronomer who played a pivotal role in a scientific revolution in the 17th century, which completely transformed our understanding of the solar system and indeed our place in the universe. Before this revolution, pretty much everyone, all the way back to ancient Greek times, had thought that the Earth was the center of the universe, that all of the planets, indeed all of the stars, actually orbited the Earth. And there's a couple of reasons. I mean, first of all, you don't feel yourself moving on the Earth, and therefore it might make sense to assume the Earth is unmoving and therefore at the center. And the second is that the church had really been advocating for this idea that the Earth was the center because human beings were the children of God and therefore we should have a special place in the universe. Kepler was one of the first scientists to publicly endorse the revolutionary heliocentric model of the solar system put forward by Copernicus. Heliocentric derives from the Greek helios for the sun, so we're really talking about a model where the sun, as we were taught at school, is the center of the solar system. But Kepler actually dramatically improved the model of Copernicus. Copernicus assumed all the planets went around the sun in perfect circles. Kepler realized that if you make those circles ellipses, you could explain the orbits of the planets much better. As an interesting side note, Kepler didn't try ellipses straight off the bat. He actually started out thinking about ovoids, which is like an egg shape. He didn't try the ellipses because they were so mathematically simple, he just assumed someone else smarter than him had probably done that before. And I think that's a good lesson from history, that often we assume these simple ideas we have have been thought of before, and actually just take the leap, try it, and you might be surprised that no one actually has thought of it before. Kepler published his now famous Laws of Motion in Astronomia Nova, A New Astronomy. Another interesting lesson from history is that even though this model performed superbly, there was a lot of pushback and resistance to this idea, especially from the church. So sadly, as we so often see in history, people didn't really appreciate the genius of what Kepler was doing until after he died. But don't worry, Kepler, just a mere 381 years later, after you died, NASA decided to put up a space telescope named in your honor. Now NASA's Kepler mission is conceptually a fairly simple idea. It just stares at 200,000 stars for about four years and simply measures the brightness changes of those stars. The reason why it does that is that some of those stars might have planets and those planets might sometimes pass in front of their star, decreasing the brightness of the star for a short amount of time. Of the nearly 200,000 stars that Kepler stared at from 2011 to 2015, it discovered nearly 5,000 planetary candidates and of those, 2,000 have now been confirmed. Now given that the geometric probability of a planet just happening to line up with its star to cause a transit is 1%, the fact that over 1% of these stars have confirmed planets around them means that on average there is at least one planet per star in the universe. To me, that statement constitutes a revolution in our understanding of our place in the universe akin to the revolution that Johannes Kepler instigated four centuries prior. Now really think about that. Before Kepler launched, of course, we did know of some exoplanets, but Kepler changed the game from being a fishing expedition to a planetary census. It really does mean that we have to shift our perception of how nature builds the universe from being that planets are a possible low probability outcome to being the inevitable outcome. Planets are everywhere. Kepler also transformed our understanding of the diversity of worlds as well. The solar system is actually not the most common type of planetary system we see. Okay, so let me give you a few examples of this. To start off with, Kepler has found that the most common type of planet in the universe is not huge gas giant planets like Jupiter or small rocky planets like the Earth, but something in between, something that we now call mini-Neptunes and we have no analogy for in the solar system. 
As a second example, Kepler was the first telescope to discover planets orbiting binary stars, so-called circumbinary planets. Think Tatooine from Star Wars. We really didn't know whether that was possible or not until Kepler saw it. And as a final example, it introduced the idea of what's now known as the Kepler dichotomy. This is the observation that there are two distinct outcomes in the architectures of alien planetary systems. On one hand, you have planetary systems which kind of resemble the solar system. They're coplanar, they're on circular orbits, but they tend to be more compact, i.e. closer to their star than the planets in the solar system are. On the other hand, you have these dynamically hot planetary systems. These tend to be just a single planet on a highly eccentric orbit, often really inclined relative to its star. So again, this is a revolution in our understanding that the solar system is not the only way to build planetary systems. In fact, it doesn't even seem to be a particularly likely one. So to me, there really have been two revolutions named after Kepler, and I genuinely think that in the future, historians will look back to now and consider it to be a golden age, revolutionizing our understanding of our place in the universe. But really, we're just getting started, and if this doesn't whet your appetite for the future of exoplanetary science, I'm not sure what will. I feel incredibly fortunate to be born at a time when I get to not only witness these events, but actually be an active participant in these discoveries which are occurring right now. So here at Columbia semester has just ended, which means the Cool Woods Lab are putting their heads down and really focusing on research hard for the next few months. Now, if you want to be amongst the first people to hear about the research and discoveries happening here at the Cool Woods Lab, then of course, if you haven't already, make sure you click the subscribe button below. So I want to thank the Kepler team for building this revolutionary telescope, which has fed my career thus far. And of course, I want to thank all of you for watching this video. So stay curious.